Welcome to our continuing series, Questions and Answers, from Sri Aurobindo and the Mother, Part 11, On God. From the Mother, we are told that there is a state of consciousness when we rise above, when we are able to go beyond both the aspect of nothingness or nirvana and the aspect of existence. There is the nirvana aspect and the existent aspect. The two simultaneous and complementary aspects of the Supreme, where all things exist eternally and simultaneously, so one can conceive God knows. This may well be another stupidity. One can conceive of a certain number of things passing into non-being, and that to our consciousness would be a disappearance or a destruction. Is that possible? I do not know. You would have to ask the Lord, but usually he does not answer such questions. He smiles. There comes a time when really one can no longer say anything. One has the feeling that whatever one says, even if it isn't absolutely inane, it is not far short of it, and that it would actually be better to keep quiet. That is the difficulty. In some of these aphorisms, you feel that he has suddenly caught hold of something above and beyond everything that can be thought. So what can one say? Naturally, when one comes down here again, one can, oh, one can say many things. As a joke, one can always joke, but one hesitates to do so because people take your joke so seriously. One could very well say, without being completely wrong, that one sometimes learns much more by listening to a madman or a fool than by listening to a reasonable man. I am quite sure of it. There is nothing that withers you more than reasonable people. 27th June, 1961 Another aphorism from Sri Aurobindo, actually a few. God is great, says the Mohammedan. Yes, he is so great that he can afford to be weak whenever that too is necessary. And number 64, God often fails in his workings. It is the sign of his illimitable Godhead. And number 65. Because God is invincibly great, he can afford to be weak. Because he is immutably pure, he can indulge with impunity in sin. He knows eternally all delight. Therefore he tastes also the delight of pain. He is inalienably wise. Therefore he has not debarred himself from folly. So the question is asked to the mother. Why does God need to be weak? And Mother replies, Sri Aurobindo does not say that God has any need of weakness. 
He says that in any particular whole, for the perfection of the play of forces, a moment of weakness may be just as necessary as a display of strength. And he adds, somewhat ironically, that since God is almighty force, he can at the same time afford to be weak, if necessary. This is to widen the outlook of certain moralists who attribute definite qualities to God and will not permit him to be otherwise. Strength as we see it and weakness as we see it are both an equally distorted expression of the divine truth, which is secretly present behind all physical manifestations. 30 June 1961 The next question to Mother. Does God ever really fail? Is God ever really weak? Or is it simply a game? Mother, it is not like that. That is precisely the distortion in the Western attitude as opposed to the attitude of the Gita. It is extremely difficult for the Western mind to understand in a living and concrete manner that everything is the divine. People are so deeply imbued with the Christian idea of God, the Creator. The creation on one side and God on the other. When you think about it, you reject it. But it has penetrated into the sensations and feelings. So, spontaneously, instinctively, almost subconsciously, you attribute to God everything you consider to be best and most beautiful, and, above all, everything you want to attain, to realize. Naturally, each one changes the content of his God according to his own consciousness, but it is always what he considers to be best. And that is also why instinctively and spontaneously, subconsciously, you are shocked by the idea that God can be things that you do not like, that you do not approve of, or do not think best. I put that rather childishly on purpose, so that you can understand it properly. But it is like that, I am sure, because I observed it in myself for a very long time. Because of the subconscious formation of childhood, environment, education, etc., you must be able to press into this body the consciousness of oneness, the absolute, exclusive oneness of the divine, exclusive in the sense that nothing exists except in this oneness, even the things we find most repulsive. And this is what Sri Aurobindo is fighting, for he too had this Christian education. He too had to struggle, and these aphorisms are the result, the flowering, as it were, of this necessity of fighting a subconscious formation. For that is what makes you ask such questions how can God be weak? How can God be foolish? How? But there is nothing other than God. Only He exists. There is nothing outside Him. 
and if something seems ugly to us, it is simply because he no longer wants it to exist. He is preparing the world so that this thing may no longer be manifested. So that the manifestation can move from that state to something else. So naturally, within us, we violently repulse everything that is about to go out of the active manifestation. There is a movement of rejection. But it is Him. There is nothing but Him. This is what we should repeat to ourselves from morning to evening and from evening to morning because we forget it at each moment. There is only Him. There is nothing but Him. He alone exists. There is no existence without Him. There is only Him. So to ask a question like this is still to react like those who make a distinction between what is and what is not divine, or rather, between what is and what is not God. How can he be weak? It is a question I cannot ask.